This is Rob Peary with the Coffee Runs Deep podcast, where we interview coffee farmers, coffee roasters, and we share their stories. Truly hope you enjoy the experience. What's going on, everybody? We have a cool episode lined up for you. Mr. Tom and I discuss his organization, which helps build homes for coffee workers. We discuss his operations in Honduras and Colombia, and we dive into topics such as how the ownership works. Uh, the transparency of the operation, how people can get involved, the cost of the home, and the living conditions that some of the coffee workers live in. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and let's dive in. Welcome to the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. I'm your host, Rob Peary, and today we have a special guest, Mr. Tom Hackett with Dwellings Now. He's doing some pretty cool things down in the producer coffee community. So, Mr. Tom, start off by introducing yourself, sharing a little about what you are doing, and let's dive into your journey. Sure. Thank you, Robert. It's great to, uh, great to be with you today. Uh, I, I do head up dwellingsnow.com. It's an organization that builds homes for families in desperate need. Our focus to date has been in, in the country of Honduras. Uh, we've also built you know, homes in Cuba, uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, and, uh, and we just got started in Colombia. And so, uh, long story, but uh, Years ago, I got started helping uh, families with homes as a result of me personally uh, receiving a home when we were homeless. And uh, through that, it, it really changed our lives. And, and my wife and I decided that we'd pay it forward and help other people with homes. And so that's what we're into doing. That's awesome. So you, you, you live in Washington then, correct? You were born and raised there? Yeah, just north of Seattle. Okay. So... What got you into the construction business? Wow. Well, it wasn't. Uh, uh, we've built a number of homes and remodeled homes, my wife and I, but I'm not really a contractor or anything like that. I've just been involved in community service projects for about the last 35 years or so in various countries. Same thing from a church to a school to medical and dental clinics uh, and now homes. And so that's taken me to a number of different countries and scenarios that uh, have just enabled me to, to do projects. I'm really a project guy. I love, you know, beginning and ending and a, 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 a completed project and here's the keys and move on to the next one. That's just kind of guy I am. And, and so, you know, I've learned a lot about construction, but mostly I'm good at coordinating people. Gotcha. Okay. So kind of like the project manager of. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So as far as like, how did you get involved like down there? What, what made you go kind of down South into, you know, Honduras and stuff like that? Sure. Well, I've always been in countries outside the United States and the South Pacific, Asia, Latin America, that kind of thing. And um, when I began building homes, I just started where I was at the time, and I knew there was a desperate need. So I happened to be on this island in the Caribbean off the coast of Honduras called Roatan. And so I, I began where I knew the need was. And since then, we've built about 120 houses on this island um, and then got exposed to the needs of people on the mainland. Uh, and then Colombia, and so you know, it's it's funny how you get going, and you get rolling in relationships, and one thing leads to another, and man, there's so many poor people and so many needs. It's it's just kind of as the doors open, you know, go through and build houses. There you go. That's awesome. That's a so you didn't start off really just helping coffee farmers or anything like that. You started off in in Roatan. Um, what does Roatan look like? I, I've, I've never really heard much of it. I know, I know you said it's an island and stuff, but I imagine it's a pretty poor type place and stuff like that. Or, Well, yes to no. There's quite a lot of tourism here. Like, for instance, there will probably be 15 cruise ships this week. And so it's incredibly beautiful. It's on the same, uh, I get them mixed up, longitude and latitude, as Maui. So it's just like Maui, Hawaii. Same climate, same kind of foliage, uh, beautiful. And it's on the second largest barrier reef of, in the world. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a mecca for scuba divers and big game fishermen and stuff like that. 
So it's just a really beautiful tropical place. It's a small island. It's only like 35 miles long and a couple miles wide. Okay, uh, but so you can drive it you know, pretty quick. Yeah, there's 100,000 people here, and it's quickly becoming more and more popular. Something like 70% of the island now is owned by foreigners, right? So there's a lot of money here. But then behind the curtain is like 90% of the population. And of those people, probably 50% live in homes made of trash. Plastic, oh, wow. boards, rusted metal, extreme poverty. And of course, the, the, the tours don't take you to those parts of the island, right. which, are, which are hidden behind, you know, uh, tropical little valleys back off the in dirt roads and stuff. But that's how, you know, there, there's so much need here. It's unbelievable. But again, tourists aren't exposed to that. Gotcha. So from Roatan, you went into mainland Honduras and you what was your focus on like the coffee farmers was that where you saw the greatest need kind of or what kind of made you go down that route yeah that was accidental awesome but accidental a guy invited me to the mainland to see a project he had up in the mountains which happens to be in one of the main coffee areas of honduras called there's like marcala which is really famous in coffee They've even got a lot of award-winning stuff going on with organic high-grade coffees and stuff. And then there's a, a, an area called uh, Esperanza in Tabuca and, and San Andres. Anyway, these really cool coffee areas. I had never experienced <clears throat> the coffee world. So I went with my friend, got exposed to what was going on with coffee by kind of accident. And... Again, uh, amazed by the extreme poverty that peasant coffee workers live in. And, uh, and so I was just like, wow, you know, I, I mean, I'm doing this on the, on the island. Why couldn't I help? You know, maybe I could help these peasant coffee farm workers. And uh, I'm thinking certainly the coffee world's going to care about these people, I would think, you know, and, and want to, to get involved in, in helping them. And so I, I, I just decided, well, I'm going to start doing this and promote it within the coffee world because most of my donors now, you know, for what I'm doing in Roatan and, and some other things, you know, they're, they're not coffee people. I mean, they're coffee drinkers, you know, they're right. Seattle people, lots of them, right? <laughs> So it's like uh, some of my main supporters would be like Amazon.com, uh, Boeing that makes the jets, you know, and all that. Oh, really? Uh, and, okay. then, and then individuals, churches, et cetera, companies that they have gotten involved with me. And now, you know, I'm, they're, they're so sold on Roatan. They love Roatan, right? Uh, and so I'm having an interesting time trying to get them to see the coffee part of the vision. And then, and then the big challenge of convincing the coffee world, you know, about, Hey, you can, uh, you can have a lot of fun doing this. Right. And you, a coffee shop in particular can build an entire community around their coffee shop, doing something amazing and, and, and building a sense of community by adopting a coffee family and building them a home. It, it's, it's an amazing experience. Yeah. And that's what I kind of want to get into a little bit too, as far as like the pricing and how much, like I was surprised that it, it doesn't really take that much money. I think you had like $17,000 on there or something for a complete build out of a, you know, bedroom bathroom you know electricity front porch like everything that's that's not that's definitely doable like a good size coffee you know roaster or shop you know you know yeah. multi-location place could could easily i feel get enough people in that community to to sponsor at least a home you know and like much you're saying, easier much easier than people think right like i just i just had a young family with kids up in washington state write me a $21,000 check to build somebody a home on the island that they met two months ago when they were here building another home for someone else, right? Oh, wow. And then, uh, and that, that's just a young family with two kids doing this. You know, they right. just were. And 
Um, yeah, the whole process of, of getting the money together to build a home can be a lot of fun uh, if, 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 if families or companies or churches or, or whatever can do it. A coffee shop has so many people going through their door that if presented to them properly, many of those people could write the check for the entire house, right? Right. Exactly. They're, just, they're just afraid or don't know how to ap approach making that happen. Right. But what it would do is make their coffee shop famous and make people be like, that's my coffee shop. We did this, you know. And right. It's really a promotable, cool way of serving the coffee world. In no, I, I definitely agree. And it's uh, something that, you know, I don't know how long we've been talking now, probably over, at least over a year, maybe even close to two years now. Um, yeah. It's definitely something I want to look into with mine. I mean, even if you kind of get the community help and yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know how long it would take. Maybe it wouldn't take longer as long as I'm thinking it would take, but it'd be something cool to kind of, you know, show. And like you said, you go to your website and there's pictures of, you know, the families and stuff like that, what y'all were doing, the build outs. And it'd be cool to kind of show everybody what you're actually doing for somebody down there. You know, it's, and I just think that'd be super cool. So real quick, I, I want to, uh, you're saying the coffee workers, um, it's not so much the coffee farm owner, you're helping the actual workers on the farm, correct? Yes. Okay. And specifically where I'm at now in Honduras and Colombia, for the most part, that's indigenous peoples. Like, like coffee isn't grown next to like giant cities full of potential workers, right? They're grown up in the mountains and remote areas. And that's where indigenous peoples have lived for centuries, right? And, and, and <clears throat> that's their world. They, they <clears throat> and they're great coffee workers because they, they, they love the land. They, the whole coffee thing is an interesting farming business. It's not like growing corn in Nebraska. You know, it's, right. it's like the owners of the farms and the workers are symbiotically connected and they're more than laborers. They're like family to, to many of these coffee owners, these farm owners, Finca owners. And so uh, they, they, they live in dis desperate conditions, the, the workers themselves, because their work, uh, they don't get paid much for what they do. And then the farmers will tell you that's for a reason. And then, you know, the whole coffee world and the debate about who's making money and who's getting screwed. It's really interesting, right? <laughs> but at the worker level, they work seasonally oftentimes. And so, and, and they're poor indigenous peoples, right? They don't have cars to go drive to other places and work. And right. They, they live in the jungle, man. And, and, and so, uh, Farmers are more than willing to be like, hey, I will be, what I do is I find farmers who are willing to be like the contractor and they will coordinate the local workers with the money we send them and build out homes for key people that work in their farm because they want those people around. They don't want to lose them. Gotcha. Okay. And right now in Honduras in particular, it's a gigantic problem in the coffee world. They're losing they're, they're skilled workers to the migration north to the U.S. border. And, and you can't just find someone to work on your farm. Growing organic coffee takes people who understand the process, have a love for the land and the culture beyond just a paycheck, and are connected relationally to farms that, 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 that there's a loving symbiotic relationship with, right? Gotcha. And so I have, I have been really fortunate to find some Finca owners who are like, Tom, I will, I will put in my time and anything I need to do and I'll oversee the build. And now we've built six homes in, in, in Honduras. There's so many we could build. And I got, I, I have these, these uh, Finca owners saying, Tom, come on, let's do another, let's do another one, you know? They love being able to serve the people that they that are their workers, and um, 
And so man, we've, we've, we're just finishing up one in, uh, in Columbia that's going, it's going to be an awesome house, our best one. Now, I do think I need to make note that there are many organizations like mine that build homes. As far as I know, we're the most expensive one I've ever heard of. The reason for that is the product. What we build is a really nice two bedroom home, finished bathroom with ceramic tile and all that, a kitchen with, you know, a, a, this is a legacy home. It's gonna, their kids are gonna, and their grandkids are gonna grow up in it. Most organizations like mine build what might be called transition housing. It's kind of a shed. Gotcha. And hopefully it has a bathroom, but many don't. So the difference in price in our organization from other organizations is the end product. And I'm committed to that end product. We, we build really amazing places. I would live in them. I, I pretty much live in one right now. The, the yeah, one I'm sitting in right today. Yeah, I, was, I was looking at the one on your website. Um, I, I, it looked like it was on on pillars. Looks like it had like you know and had stairs going up to it, big front porch and everything. And I was thinking the same thing. Like that'd be a nice little place to live, you know. So really nice looking place to live. It, it, they're very very nice, and and we build to the location. For example, up in the mountains, we don't build out of wood. It's not really available. So we build out of adobe or block or whatever is like location appropriate and locally constructed. So the money that we're spending is going into the local economy. There's a win for a whole lot of people in this process. And we don't mandate that a house be exactly a certain way. There's a discussion with the farmer and the employee as to, well, you know, uh, there might be multiple families, you know, a grandparent and, and a family and whatever that all need to live in this home. So we might adapt it, add a bedroom, do something different, and, and make it appropriate and custom, right? So again, that's why our price is, is what it is. And uh, when we're done, like everybody wants one of our houses in, in the area. Like, right. Wow, we want one of those. You know? Okay, so y'all don't have like a strict template y'all go by every time you're building one. It can be kind of different everywhere you go we then. Yes, we have a general idea, but there can be a, a, a custom. For example, the one we have in Columbia right now, the guy who's the, the father of the family is actually an abanil or a, a, a contractor bricklayer. And he's like, Tom, you know, like I can save some money by not ch charging for my, my work. And can I take that money and add another bedroom? Yeah, dude, you know, let's do it. And so I'm going to be doing a, a presentation of this home in April. I'll make sure you get some pictures. It's going to be probably our best home ever. And it's, it's, on a, it's in a, a remote location that would just blow your mind. I mean, you open up his porch, you know, his front door. You walk about 20 feet, and there's a cliff about a 500-foot drop you know, out his door. Oh, and, wow. and they're growing coffee on that. You know, he's just like, what? It's amazing. Anyway, I could go on and on about that. Yeah, that's super cool. So how many houses have you built like on, I guess, like in Honduras and Colombia? And how, how many do you plan to build for, say, 2022? Like, do you have like, uh, I guess, goals as far as like how much money you have coming in, what you're trying to get built for 2022? Yes. Um, We've built about 140 homes total that would include, again, Honduras, uh, Cuba, and, and Colombia. Uh, our goal this year is to build 40 homes, which would be by far the most we've ever built. Uh, and probably about 20 of those will be 15 to 20 in Colombia, and probably the other 20 here uh, in Honduras. Um, we are, I mean, that's just something we're projecting, hoping to accomplish, right? I mean, apart from miraculous provision of donations, which uh, seem to happen a lot, uh, that will determine how many we, we can do. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're shooting for 40. But, you know, the, the goal by 2026 is to be building uh, 200 homes a year. Oh, wow. So, okay. yeah, we're, we're building and building and we have 
especially with coffee homes, we have a scalable way of accomplishing it in 50 locations at once. Uh, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, so we're hoping to get more into like million, two million, three million, whatever, large grant money as well over the next year or two. Uh, but those are all just, you know, goals that we're working on. Gotcha. So then as far as like the coffee farms, um, the land you're building it on, would it be owned by the coffee producer, like the farmer, or do the actual workers own that little bit of land? How's the ownership down there of the house kind of? Right. How does that work? Uh, yeah. So the, the, the home, one of our like rules, I guess the, uh, or prerequisites is that the, is that the employee has land or, or the, the owner, the recipient of the home has to own land. Okay. And, and that's somewhat kind of doable for, for, for people. Um, and that's so that we're not building for a squatter. There's a lot of squatting that goes on in these countries, right? A lot. And, and, or they're uh, so that, so that they, we don't build a home and then the owner comes along and takes it away because right. all of a sudden their land's like worth a lot of money because there's nice houses. on. Well, what's happened uh, in the coffee situation in particular is that farmers, again, they have a, almost a rela a family relationship with their workers. They're like, look, I will, I will give that worker some land. And we require that they put it, that in a document form, right? And it's like, this is their land. Okay. And then we will work with that farmer to build them a home. Again, farmers are desperate to keep their workers. People have, now that I've had four or five years of exposure to the coffee world, at the farm level, it's critical uh, for the sustainability of your farm, the quality of your coffee, that you have the right people work in your land. And you can't just go to town and hire people. They'll destroy your crop and your plants in one harvest. You know? <laughs> they don't know what they're doing and they don't have the physical ability to do it. These farms are on inclines like this, dude. And, and you've got 50,000 plants to pick four times in a, in a, in a in a season dude you need right. people that are physically able to do that and do it without wrecking your harvest so farmers are just like they they want their people to to prosper and stick around okay and that definitely makes sense then i mean if you kind of work with them to give them some land build a house and everything like that it definitely kind of you know solidifies having one group of people that you get to work with every year instead of you know, kind of contracting out every year. Um, do you see a lot of the farmers kind of pushing in that direction or is it just a few or is it the majority that you're speaking to down there? In the direction of? Of like trying to build homes and stuff for, for the workers themselves instead of? No, I mean, I, I, you know, showed up at this awesome cooperative called Comsa in the, in the city of uh, town of Marcala Honduras, and they represent 1,500 organic coffee farmers in the immediate area, right? And um, I presented this idea to them, and they just like, oh, dude, you know, when 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 we have the right kind of grants and things like that with significant money, they're mo they're ready to network with me to to train multiple, you know, farmers to be able to do this for, for their workers. Right now, we've only built three through one Finca owner that I met originally, right, in Marcala. Gotcha. But, but, but there are co-ops of, 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 of processors and exporters that, that want to do this. And I'm just presenting them with some ideas and the funding, of course, that is, is uh, innovative to them. They've never thought about doing it this way or... And they're like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll make it happen with you. We... And, and, and so what the farmer is doing is what he's committing to is that is the time of the court and, and effort involved in coordinating, you know, the maestro, the, the guy building the home and the materials getting delivered 
but they already know these people because these people have done work on their farms, built a gotcha. bodega, <clears throat> poured a slab to dry coffee, you know, so it's like, oh, hey, Jose, you know, I need you for to do this project. Awesome. Jose's got work, you know, and and it's very, very affordable. The, the, the Finko owner, who's like the contractor, is putting it's all volunteer on his part, which is a significant effort. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about that, too. So the I guess like the, the contractors and stuff coming in, um, you're not bringing in, you know, a whole team to build these places out. A lot of it is the actual community around this farm coming in and doing the masonry, doing, doing the, the, the woodwork, doing the slab work, the foundation work and stuff like that. Yes. We, we don't really, uh, on the, on the Island of Roatan, I, Roatan, I have a construction team. Well, it's one guy right. <laughs> and, his, and his sister who, who's my assistant here. Um, and they coordinate all these teams of Americans coming down and building out these houses. But when it comes to the coffee stuff, no, I, what I do is I do all the networking. I tell the story of the farm worker and, and the Finca owner and network generous donors from the state's money and then verify that things are being done right and completed with literally weekly reports of photos and receipts. So, I mean, it's like, uh, it's a very transparent process and it's very cost effective because I have a really small footprint, you know? Right. And once we get one build behind us, like let's say there's a Finca owner, he has a successful time. He's like, Tom, that was the most fun. Awesome. I want to do it again. I know another family or my brother's got a farm. He's got a family. We want to do it again. Then now it's like, okay, we've already got the process understood. And, and, and I wire him $2,500, right? And then he has to provide me with pictures and receipts, right? To show me this is how he spent the money. And as it goes down, I wire him another $2,500. So there's, there's, you know, the, the, there's not, it's worked out fantastic. And we have very much control and verifying how that money is being spent. So a donor gets to see all this in real time. That's pretty cool. So I was, I was kind of wondering, you know, you know, just throwing out a number. So say you donate $10,000 and then you go and you hire a, I guess, a American type team to go down there. Well, the, the money is not even, it's not staying down in Honduras or whatever. So you're, you're basically utilizing the community down there. So whatever money is being spent is being spent in that community. And then, you know, basically kind of creating their economy to build those houses and stuff like that. So 100%. Okay. 100%. That's pretty, that's pretty cool then. Um, yeah. so do you see much help from like, I always see a bunch of blogs and like coffee bloggers and coffee, you know, uh, specialty coffee, SCA and all these putting out these, you know, news things about like helping coffee farmers and producers like that. Do you see much help from the coffee side, like the specialty coffee, you know, whether it be organizations, roasters, or, you know, kind of well, larger scale coffee individuals? Well, unfortunately, almost none. Okay. <laughs> but, but that's not, I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody. Part of it is exposure. I mean, if people don't know yeah. you, you exist, how do they respond, right? Right. And so it's been the last couple of years, a lot of posting on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, that exposure is hit and miss and, and there's been a certain amount of, hey, I like your ideas, but no one really contributing up, up to this point. Uh, my money continues to come from the same generous people I know who fund Roatan houses that aren't right. coffee houses, right? And, and so uh, I, I, I really, uh, I want to give the coffee world, especially coffee shops, because Look at if a little youth group church can raise twenty thousand dollars, certainly oh, yeah. your coffee shop can. Every day there's probably fifty people who drive through your drive up window who could build right half the check right. if they knew what to do, if they knew about it, right? Yeah. But it, people think, oh, you know, it's going to take away from my business, or it's going to my 
it's going to offend my clientele or man. It's just like, well, it's because you don't understand how you can present it. It can be like a life changing experience for them to get involved. And then when it comes time to present the keys to the house, the coffee shop owner and a couple of people that want to go with them should come down and present the keys, maybe paint the house for a couple of days with the local family. And they'll go home with a lifetime of stories and pictures to be posted all over their coffee shop. Right. Right. And they'll want to do it over and over again because it's so easy and it's so life changing and they can source their coffee in parts from that particular farm if they want to. Right. It's, it's really, really cool. Yeah. Cause I mean, when you, when you read through a lot of these, you know, coffee organizations, I feel, I don't know. Personally, I just feel it's a, a lot of them like to say the good things that need to be done and, and what we should be doing and what they want to do. But you don't see it. For me, it doesn't seem like you see too much of people actually doing it. And I think that's one thing with you actually down there getting the houses built and stuff like that. Like, I think if we can have more coffee, you know, shops, roasters, even even some of the coffee organizations kind of helping out magazines, whatever, you know, bigger, bigger blogs, bigger um, podcast channels, YouTube channels, whatever, kind of helping out. Um, cause I mean, there are some, I'm just thinking there's some espresso machines that you could buy that would build a house down there. You know what I mean? It's like, it's crazy when you start yeah. thinking about some of the machines they have sitting on these shelves and these counters, when you go in and at somebody's house, that could be sitting there, you know? So, uh, the money is definitely well, there. It's just, how do you, how, like you're saying too, how do you, how do you market it to these people? And then how do you kind of get your name out and stuff like that? So, yeah. wow. that's And there are some really uh, big copy names that are doing some really cool things. I just happen to be focused on, on, on families that have needs and are living like animals. It, it just was what motivates <laughs> me, right? And so uh, it's, it's, just, it's just another level among many levels of how people can invest in the, in the coffee world. This happens to be the thing I'm into. And, and uh, yeah, so be that, but I welcome, I, I, I really want relationships with coffee world people. We, we will develop the marketing tools for you, whether it's a, a, a poster for your, your, your coffee shop or something on near the cash register or, or something, a business card size thing you can put out with your drive through window or all kinds of ways that you can create, invite people into the process of what your coffee shop is doing and, and, and not have it be offensive at all or take away from your client, your, your bottom line. Right. You know what exactly. I mean? And, and so, because there's so many people that are moved by a legitimate opportunity to help others, right? Like I, I sit on, on, I've sat on planes next to people, you know, how you get into the, oh, what do you do? What do you do? By the end of the flight, the guy wrote me $35,000 check. You know, oh, I mean, wow. There's, there's just so many people that are, so, I, the reason, can I tell one story about how Columbia started? Oh, yeah, tell away. Okay, I'm going to make it fast. You can always edit it out. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to get started in Columbia. I will go down for a visit. I spend two months flying all over, seeing all of Columbia. As I'm flying home on an airplane, I'm about to touch down in Houston, Texas before flying to Seattle. And I'm thinking in, on the airplane, I'm not going to get weird on you here, but God, I need money to start Columbia. I don't have any money. And this is going to take $30,000, $40,000 get a foundation, build a house, proof of concept, build relationships, all nine yards. I, I, you know how you land on a plane and all of a sudden your phone goes off, bing, 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 you know, messages. And then there's bing, one, live, the second I land, there's a guy on the, on the phone texting me. And he's a guy who has do, donated significant amounts of money to me in the past. Not to me, but to our organization. And, it, and here's it, it's all it says, Tom, I have $32,000. What's on your heart to do? That's the message. I'm on the plane, you know, saying, God, I need money. And I'm like, right there, boom, dude, I want to start a thing in Columbia. Awesome. Here's, I'll send the money next week. 
That's how Columbia got started. One guy from Oklahoma That's awesome. City. That's Oklahoma awesome. City, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> That's great. And that's where you met, um, I forget his name. Uh, you, I think you said he was like the Crocodile Dundee of Columbia. Is that where you met when, whenever you moved into down in Columbia? On that first trip, I spent time in the Valle de Calca in, in, the, in the town of Morales, Morales which is one it. of the most red zones of Columbia. Very dangerous. <laughs> I didn't really know how dangerous at the time. But uh, right now, we, we've established our headquarters on the city of Santa Marta, which is on the north coast uh, on the Caribbean. And we're involved in a town called Palmore. You need to look that up, P-A-L-M-O-R. It is copy central. This is something right out of an, of a, of an awesome movie. This whole town exists. Uh, year round, it's coffee. I'm, I'm there for my first time. I wake up in the morning. It's surrounded by mountains. There's pathways and, and roads. And, and, and in, in the morning, I wake up 6 o'clock. It's light. Everywhere, from all around these mountains, there are mule trains of coffee coming into the town from really remote coffee farms or fincas, you know, even Kogi ind indigenous tribal Indians. And, and, and coming in, there must have been 300 mules in that town by the end of the day, right? Oh, wow. Offloading their stuff in different bodegas who are, and, and, and yeah. So, I mean, this place is so cool that if you like coffee, I mean, you've got to come down and I want to take you to Palmore. It's, it'll blow your mind. It's National Geographic every day. I think we was talking about that last time too. Are are you planning to do any um type of like tour? Not like tour, I guess, but uh kind of like trips. No, tours. Tours a good word. I've I've done several okay. in Honduras, but in Colombia, and it's really cheap to get to Colombia. My next round trip ticket out of Miami with extra luggage and everything, direct, you no, know, from Fort Lauderdale, three hundred and twenty-five dollars round trip. Oh, wow. That ain't bad at all. Dude, that's not bad at all. And of course, I fly free to, to Miami on Southwest with all my miles. So it's like a $325 round trip with all the luggage. And you want to bring luggage because you want to pack your luggage with coffee to come home with it. Gotcha. Stuff like that. Uh, but it's very affordable. And if it's, if it's one person or a group from a coffee shop, I'll... I'll take them on a, you know, three, four, five day tour. Take them back into a Kogi village, dude. You got to look up Kogi, K-O-G-I. The Kogi Indians or Kogi indigenous tribe. They, they live an eight hour walk from Palmur. And they walk down and back in the same day, 16 hours. Oh, wow. They offload their coffee and walk home. But I would, I would love to have uh, people come down and visit me. Dude, I'll, I'll, I'll show them the coffee world that, that they will love, dude. I mean, and respect. and That's super cool. So what do you see is the, like, thing that's going to help you grow the quickest going forward? Like, uh, as far as help, do you need, like, physical help or would it be finances or? Like, yeah, you know, the, the way that we're doing it now in Colombia, the way we're doing it in Honduras on this island is that the groups that raise the money, let's say it's a coffee shop or a church or a, uh, a, a high school group or whatever it is, a couple of families get together, they raise the money, they fly down and they build the house. We can build the house in five days, right? Nice house. We have a system. In Colombia, we're doing that different because it's a cement block house that takes time, right? So what we're going to do is include groups that want to, to come down and spend like three or four days at the end of the process to maybe uh, tile floors or put in the kitchen the or paint the house yeah. or do things that are, you know, not laying block, right? Um, and, and so... Uh, 
because we do most of the work before a team would show up or if a team doesn't show up at all, yeah, money's really the big thing. And, and we do it in the name of that company, right? So it'd be like uh, your local coffee shop builds a house and that's what's promoted. Uh, we facilitate it and we'd be like a little logo and you'd be like a big logo. <laughs> gotcha. Just like in cooperation with dwellings, such and such coffee shop is building a home in, you know, Palmore, Colombia for a local coffee worker from which we happen to source our, our product, right? Yeah. Gotcha. And there's award-winning coffees coming out of this area. The Kogi Indians have been growing coffee for centuries, dude. And, and this is about as organic as it can possibly get, right? And, and, and they're, they, our company has the exclusive right and own Kogi Coffee. Oh, cool. And so the story behind that, see, Colombia is extremely proud of their coffee. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, you, you can't say they're not, the, you have to say they're the best so they'll run you out of town. <laughs> I mean, your life's at stake. And they are very proud. And Palmore, you know, they, they consider themselves the capital of Colombian coffee. <laughs> but it's this little town of like six, eight hundred people. But there must be 20 warehouses in this town. It's 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 built around coffee, everything. That's great. Right? If I could get people, especially to come <clears throat> during the harvest, blow their mind. Uh, of, of how cool it is yeah i would love anyway. to see like all the mules and stuff coming down that'd be that'd be a sight to see for sure yeah i do got one question as far as like the transparency of it um so i think you said like one house can be around like seventeen thousand. build a whole whole house and that's that's american dollars then correct yes and and just the to be completely transparent a portion of that goes to our administrative fund so we can exist and do what we do. Right. We have a lot of expenses. And then there's a hard cost to the house. And so, and, and that's how we get our operating money. We don't get a lot of donations apart from building the home, gotcha. right? So we have to generate money in that process to exist. Okay, we've got staff to pay. We have vehicles, we have tools, we have, Transportation Airplane tickets. We right. have lawyers. Oh my gosh, lawyers! Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so anyway, <laughs> um, but again, that's completely transparent. As we're spending the money, the sponsor will get those pictures and those receipts. They would they would be copied in emails. Okay. Right. Yeah. See, I think that's the coolest thing because, I mean seems like a lot of people are just about transparency nowadays. And with the internet, I feel everything can be so much more transparent than what it ever could be. So I, I, that's, that's one of the things too. If you have a coffee shop, I mean, literally you could have something on the wall where, where you're at in the process. And like every week you could see, Hey, y'all need a little bit. We need this more to hit the goal. And then like, you know, at the end you could show like what the, what the outcome was and stuff like that. I think it'd be, so you send all like the receipts and stuff like that, where you can see exactly how much money is being put in, basically stuff's being purchased for the house as, as you go yeah there's a ledger kept on every home gotcha and then i don't know if they would see the receipt but they would see the ledger right I mean, just kind of a, a, a receipt in spanish they don't even know what a right, exactly. is. You know, right. that long. <laughs> Care uh yeah oh and another thing that's really cool is that all these people even these kogi indians have cell phones dude and everybody's on what's up and 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 facebook and you can like be communicating with your family the whole time and they'll be into it believe me i mean they're going to get a home from this group of people somewhere in the united states and and they're actually following them these guys are going to be getting messages from these families like you know here's a picture of my donkey here's a picture of my chicken here's <laughs> you know here's here's a picture of the farm and it's a cliff right with a bunch of cliffs plants on it you know or here's my 10 year old daughter picking coffee with me today yeah i mean just by the time it's done if they happen to come down to present the keys they'll be like this is like my most favorite family in the world you know yeah. sort of deal 
a byproduct of that relationship during the pandemic here on the island, uh, because it was tourist related, everybody was out of work and everybody was starving, zero income, right? So except for our families who had been had, you know, a hundred and some families who had had relationships with the families that built them, those families stepped in and would send them 50 or a hundred dollars a month. And that's what kept them alive. Oh, wow. So we became a relief organization there for a couple of years, you know, as people would donate money and designate it for their family had built for three years ago. Right. right? But they have this WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook thing going on for three years. Right. So anyway, everybody gets to connect with their family too. And it's fun to get some, you know, they get some message in Spanish or something, you get a translator and, and you put that quote up with the picture, you know, <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. That's one thing I've noticed too, like on Instagram, like a lot of the farmers that I speak to and stuff like that, like, I mean, you'd be surprised how far out in some of these, what I, what I would think would be remote areas, you know, they're, they're able to communicate. And a lot of times it is in Spanish or something, but Instagram and some others will translate it. So, I mean, you, you kind of can still speak to them, which is a pretty cool, like, yeah, like, like you're saying, you can, you can connect and build relationships with coffee farmers, even though you've never been down there or never, you know, may get to go down there for a, a long time or something, but yeah, it's just cool. Mm -hmm. You can still create these relationships with them and, and help out and do stuff like that. Yeah. So I guess if you had, you know, one thing to wrap up your, I mean, for lack of a better word, pitch or, you know, kind of what you're wanting to do and what you need help for, what would that be? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, right now we have a situation <laughs> that's, it's, that's, that's uh, you know, time is of the essence. I interviewed a family about a month or two ago in the mountains of Honduras, the Lopez family. They're Linca Indian or Linca indigenous people who all work in coffee from the grandma to the child, right, level. It's a, it's a grandma with two siblings who have, you know, then her grandkids. Well, about just prior to the COVID thing, their home got destroyed by two hurricanes that came through Honduras and destroyed their homes. They don't have any money, you know, or they're just surviving. They lost everything. And they, the, they, because of COVID, the town let them move into the school, the local school. So that's where they lived the last two years. Well, they desperately need a home. I've got a, I've got a, a website where we're raising money for them. And I, I'll send you that link. And, um, we, we, now they've been kind of schools back in the session. They had to leave. Right. I'm not really sure where they left to, but I'm sure it's not pretty. <laughs> and they have a, a nice piece of land, uh, you know, a nice piece of land. And, and my guy who's built three homes with me now, this Finca owner, he's like, Tom, we got to do, we got to do something, you know, got to do something. And he's ready to go. Uh, you know, he's ready to start building that thing. And uh, we don't have any donations and we, we desperately need money. Um, see, at the same time, I'm raising $400,000 over here with my regular people. They're not coffee people. Right. And so I'm like, this one, I really need the coffee world to step up, you know, because these people are desperate. And, uh, and so I'll send you a link to that. The Lopez family, it's got pictures of the family, all that. Uh, the men of the family and the older kids weren't there when I was there. They were out harvesting coffee that day, but I got pictures of the mom and the kid and the little kids, stuff like that. Uh, and their story, their family story, right? And uh, people can, can give right there on that site. They can share the link to the site, all that sort of thing. But I would love to get started on this home for the Lopez family. Once when you interview a family, right, you get so connected to you. They tell you their story, and unless you are the hardest person in the world, you know, you're like by the end. Typically, you're like, "Wow, I have got to do something." Right. And 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 that's the difference too between getting involved in an organization where you just send money, and one where you can really connect with the family. Because 
that's that connection that requires you to do something. Right. You can't become that aware without some kind of compassion. And compassion always moves to action if you know if you'll respond to compassion, right? Right. So hearing their story, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, I'm just like, oh, geez, I, I got it. I got to do something for this family. So that's what I want to end with is that I've got a family we could uh, rally people around. And they're one of hopefully hundreds or thousands of families over the years before I die. I get to help provide a home for. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll definitely uh do my best to kind of push it out the best I can and, and definitely get your story out there and stuff. And I haven't donated this year yet, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll uh I'll go ahead and get with you on the the Lopez family too, and I'll get with you on that. And uh, also, I want to talk to you offline. You know, I got a coffee shop and roastery. I'm getting set up, and I'd like to kind of, I don't know, work out something with you. So, sure. well, Mr. Tom, I appreciate you coming on, and I will uh, I'll link all your stuff below. So if you you know dwellingsnow.com and um, any other sites you have, uh, I know you got something you said you wanted to show. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just another uh, dwellingsnow.com is. Um, is uh is the u.s foundation and then this is the columbia uh nonprofit. it's v-d-c-o-l viviendas dignas.org and this is a website for our new columbia organization right and they can check out specifically uh you know content for columbia okay on um, dwellingsnow.com, we have Honduras and Colombia. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And if uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the the image and then I'll link everything down below too. So that'll awesome. work. Mr. Tom, I Thanks, appreciate man. you coming on and uh, thank you so much. Good deal. I hope to see you in Colombia. Heck yeah. I want to get down there soon. Okay. Thanks so much for tuning into the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. Tom is an extraordinary man with a big heart for helping others and... I know most of us do a lot of talking, including myself, but people like Tom are the ones who truly leave lasting impacts on this world. If you feel inclined to donate, please do so with the links below. In the next episode, we'll be talking with a coffee roaster out of California, so stay tuned for that. Love you, see you soon, and I'm out.